Hi, my name is Ignacio Monge. I'm an intensivist. I've been working as an intensivist in the intensive care unit of the Hospital of Jerez de la Frontera in the south of Spain. I've been also focused on cardiovascular physiology and hemodynamic monitoring during the last 20 years. And I've been also publishing about dynamic arterial elastins, DPDT, and ventricular arterial coupling during the last five, seven years with a renowned names on cardiovascular physiology. Well, actually, it's a, it's a difficult uh, question because we don't have an, a definitive uh, answer or definition of intraoperative hypotension. Actually, there are several definitions of intraoperative hypotension, but if we have to find an a overall definition, probably the mean arterial pressure below 65 millimeters of mercury could be a good definition. And that definition is good because of two reasons. The first one is because it's that threshold of mean arterial pressure has been consistently associated with post-operative outcomes on those patients. And from a physio physiological point of view, selecting 65 uh, millimeters of mercury makes sense because that threshold it, it's always associated with hyperperfusion and post-operative complications. So I think if we have to choose one definition, probably 65 millimeters of mercury could be a reasonable, good definition. But again, it's a difficult question because there are several definitions. If a patient has arterial hypotension, that means that the patient is in risk to develop hypoperfusion. And hyperperfusion means organ failure and post-operative complication. So the longer and the more severe the arterial hypotension, the more likely the development of hyperperfusion. So there is a clear association between intraoperative hypotension and postoperative outcomes. There is not yet a clear casualty. There is no casual relationship, but there is a strong and consistent association between intraoperative hypotension and postoperative outcomes. So makes sense to keep the arterial pressure below a pretty fine level to maintain and to avoid hyperperfusion on those patients. More prevalent than we think. Unfortunately, we think, we usually think that our patients have not arterial hypertension, that arterial hypertension is not our problem. But every time we look carefully to our clinical practice, we realize that intraoperative hypertension is more frequent than we think. So that problem is present in almost every single surgery. So we need to think about the intraoperative hypertension as a potential factor defining the postoperative outcome. And more importantly, that factor can be avoided. And that is very important. Uh, again, that is not an easy question <laughs> because there is no one single treatment for uh, arterial hypertension. Uh, the outcome will be exactly the same, hypertension, but the mechanisms leading to arterial hypertension could be quite different. So in the operating room, we could have hypovolemia, we could have a cardiac impairment, or we could have, for example, vasodilation, and all of them uh, could require different treatments. So eventually the arterial hypertension could be the final pathway of all of those mechanisms, but we should define our treatment according to the mechanisms that will lead to arterial hypertension. So it depends on the mechanism. So we have to deal every day with the uh, hemodynamic instability with arterial hypertension in all of our patients. And we know that every time that our patients have arterial hypertension, they are in risk to develop hypoperfusion. And that hyperperfusion could make the difference uh, after the surgery. So the HPI software will help us to predict that our patient is going to develop arterial hypertension. So it's, a, it's an index that will help us to determine if our patient is in risk to develop arterial hypertension. And that, that index could help us also to act before the arterial hypertension. And if we don't have arterial hypertension, we are not in risk to develop hyperperfusion. That's the rationale for using the HPI software. Okay, HPI software is an alarm 
that will tell us that the patient is becoming more unstable and will help us to react or to prevent the development of arterial hypotension. We are able to act before the arterial hypotension. So if the HPI algorithm will help us to predict that the patient is going to develop arterial hypertension, the secondary screen will help us to determine why the patient is going to be hypotensive. So the HPI won't tell us why the patient is going to be hypotensive. Secondary screen will tell us why. So these secondary screen parameters will help us to determine the mechanism leading to arterial hypotension. And the three main mechanisms are usually hypovolemia. And we have the stroke volume variation that could help us to, uh, to determine the preload responsiveness of our patients. We have the arterial DPDT, which could help us to determine or to track the changes in left ventricular contractility. And we have also the dynamic arterial last time, which could help us to determine what is the pressure responsiveness to fluid administration. With the use of all of these three parameters in combination with the usual advanced hemodynamic monitoring that we have in our monitor, we could determine what is the reason for the increased value of the HPI and what is the reason for the increased risk of developing arterial hypertension. So defining hemodynamic instability is not easy, but if we had to find a simple definition, it could be this one. When your cardiovascular system is not able to provide the right environment to sustaining the perfusion to the tissues, and if you ask to any physician what is hemodynamic instability, 99% of all of those physicians will answer arterial hypotension. No, they are not the same because being unstable doesn't mean that you are in shock. Being unstable means that you are in risk to develop shock. And that's the problem because when you are hypotensive, you have a higher risk to develop hyperperfusion, but you could be normotensive and you could have hyperperfusion. So hypotension is always, always an alarm, but being normotensive doesn't mean that you are out of risk to develop hypoperfusion. So stroke volume variation is the changes induced by mechanical ventilation, positive pressure mechanical ventilation. So the degree of those changes will define if your patient is preload dependent or not. A patient that is preload dependent will increase the cardiac output after fluid administration. And if the HPI software is telling to you that your patient is in risk to develop high, uh, arterial hypertension, the stroke volume variation could help you to determine if the hypovolemia could be the main reason for the increased HPI value. If we know how the arterial pressure will change with changes in the stroke volume, we can predict what is going to happen to the arterial pressure after fluid administration in a preload dependent patient. So if I know that my patient is going to increase the cardiac output because the patient is preload dependent, I am able to predict also if the blood pressure is going to increase due to fluid administration. And because the main concern is to be hypotensive, the combination of using the stroke volume variation with dynamic arterial lessons would help us to predict not only what is going to happen to the cardiac output, but also what is going to happen to the blood pressure. So we can predict if my patient is going to increase cardiac output, but also with the use of dynamic arterial lessons, if we can increase the blood pressure with fluid administration. Dynamic arterial elastin is actually a, a very recent Mm, parameter. So we have been using this new index for defining pressure responsiveness from the last years. The first clinical use of dynamic arterial lessons for was for defining if a patient was able to increase blood pressure with fluid administration, but also there are other uses of the dynamic arterial lessons. For example, the group of the French group of uh, Pierre Gregor Guinot. They have been using dynamic arterial elastins for defining if a patient will cope with a decrease in norepinephrine infusion. So dynamic arterial elastin could help us to predict if the mean arterial pressure is going to decrease after reducing the norepinephrine infusion in cardiac patients. The arterial DPDT is a surrogate for tracking the changes in left ventricular contractility. So 
The faster the increase on the systolic part of the arterial pressure, the better the contractility. And we can use that DPDT continuously from the arterial pressure waveform. So it's an advantage over other parameters. And it has been validated against the gold standard of contractility. So we can obtain a reliable parameter for tracking the contractility in, uh, on the left ventricle with the radial DPDT. So the hypotension prediction index, the HPI algorithm, will tell you that your patient is becoming unstable and the likelihood to be hypotensive is becoming higher and higher. But you need to define, you need to determine why your patient is becoming hypotensive and you need to check the information from the secondary screen and you need to determine what is the optimal treatment to avoid the arterial hypertension, and that is information is on the secondary screen parameters. There is a straight relationship between mean arterial pressure and the HPI. Actually, there is a relationship yet that you can check on the HPI and mean arterial pressure, but importantly, that relationship is not unique. That relationship could change on the same patient over time. But that HPA relationship with the mean arterial pressure could be different from one patient to another. So obviously the mean arterial pressure is one of the most important parameters on the HPI, but the relationship is not predictable and it's not unique. The HPI was validated with a large number of patients from different settings, from the ICU and from the operating room. So the HPI was validated on both surgical and ICU patients. So the HPI was actually obtained from the analysis of the blood pressure waveform, and the, the HPI is looking to those features that will predict which patients are going to develop arterial hypertension. Every time that we try to introduce a new technology on clinical practice, there are three stages. The first one is the validation stage in which you need to demonstrate that your new technology is able to do what it's telling to us that it's able to do. But the second one is if this technology is able to impact on the outcome, for example, the HPI is able to reduce the intraoperative hypertension. But there is a last stage in which you need to demonstrate that your technology is able to impact on the clinical outcome. So, so far, we are now on the third stage, actually, because we have validated the use of the HPI. HPI is able to predict the arterial hypertension. The HPI is able to reduce the intraoperative hypertension. And now we are working and we are now demonstrating that the HPI reducing the intraoperative hypertension has a significant impact on the clinical outcome. There are uh, a lot of new studies ongoing that will focus mainly on this question. Our study, our group, has published recently a paper about the impact of the HPI on this post-operative outcome. This is a, a unicenter study, a retrospective study, but we found that on those patients in which we use the HPI, we were able to reduce the intraoperative hypertension, but more importantly, that reduction of intraoperative hypertension was associated with a, re a reduced number of complications and length of stay. So now we demonstrate that the HPI is able to predict the arterial hypertension, is able to reduce the intraoperative hypertension, and could have a significant impact on clinical outcome. We have recently published a paper on journal clinical uh, monitoring and computing uh, from the Hospital de Valdecilla in Santander, in which we retrospectively analyzed the data from patients who were treated according to the HPI and an algorithm using the HPI and patients that were treated according to the goal directed flow therapy. And what we found was that the use of the HPI was associated with a significant decrease in the intraoperative hypertension. But more importantly, that reduction on intraoperative hypertension was associated with a reduced number of postoperative complications and length of stay. The predict 
H, it's a multi-center randomized control trial that we performed in Spain. We started in before pandemic and we finished after the pandemic. What we try to demonstrate or to, to test is the hypothesis that using the HPI in a protocolized manner, we were able to reduce the intraoperative hypotension and in comparison with the goal-directed flow therapy. We also measured the tissue lar oximetry and muscle level and uh, markers of renal function. In this study, we found that the use of the HPI on, on a, in a protocolized manner, we can reduce the intraoperative hypotension much better or uh, higher than the use of the goal-directed therapy. And importantly, we haven't found any difference of the perfusion. And usually we are very concerned about the use of a pressure aimed therapy instead of flow therapy. But we, we haven't found any negative impact on the perfusion with the use of the HPI. And fortunately, our study was not designed for detecting uh, huge differences on the perfusion. But now we have started a new national multicenter study here in Spain, promoted by the Spanish Society of Anesthesia, that will cover more than 900, 900 patients. And in this study, what we want to demonstrate is the use of the HPI is able to reduce the acute kidney injury after the surgery. So we have a clear clinical outcome in this study. So we will try to answer what we can answer with the predict age. If you think that monitoring and using the HPI software will make your life more complex, you're absolutely wrong. Because the use of the HPI software will help you to understand and decode the situation and the condition of your patient. Unfortunately, you are usually reacting to the problems with the use of the HPI software, you could manage your patient, but wisely, because you know what's happening to your patient and knowing what's happening to your patient will help you to decide better treatments and avoiding more problems. If I have to choose what could be the best patients for using this technology, I will say that if you are considering to uh, to perform uh, uh, monitoring, usual monitoring in your patient because your patient is in high risk, I will, I will use this technology for sure. So it makes no sense to use hemodynamic monitoring with, without this prediction tool because this prediction tool will complement, will give you additional information that could make a huge impact on the outcome of your patient. There are a lot of patients in which we want to monitor because we know that those patients deserve to be monitored. But unfortunately, we don't want to use this invasive technology. We don't want to put an invasive arterial line. So now that we have these non-invasive options, we have the opportunity to monitor them. And I think it's quite, it could be quite interesting because usually those patients have only intermittent blood pressure measurements. And we know that only looking to the blood pressure every five, 10, 15 minutes, it's not enough. So this non-invasive technology with the HPI could give us more awareness about the problems that those patients could develop, but also we could have an comprehensive information about the hemodynamic status that is at our fingertip. We can talk about the individualization of blood pressure management. And that means that we should individualize the blood pressure targets. And that could be uh, difficult at the bedside. For example, uh, why do we need to use this threshold of 65 instead of using an individualized blood pressure threshold for our, our patients? Unfortunately, we cannot determine what is the best pressure to each patient at the bedside because we don't have the right tools for defining if this threshold is enough for all the organs. But we know that these 65 millimeters of mercury could be a good overall threshold for all of our patients. Of course, individualizing blood pressure management 
makes sense from a clinical point of view, but it will take time to determine how to do that. I think this is a, actually a, an exciting moment here because we are now giving our first steps on prediction and using uh, artificial intelligence in medicine in anesthesiology and critical care. And uh, the use of the HPI software actually for me is like the first stage of what is coming. And in terms of blood pressure management, I think there could be more improvements on the algorithm, there could be more uh, improvements in terms of individualizing the threshold of the mean arterial pressure, but also it, will be, it could be possible to determine from the machine what could be the best treatment or what is the reason for the, for the arterial hypotension. So all of those improvements could be part of the future. And I think I, we are actually very, very lucky because we are part of that history. So since the introduction of the HPI in my hospital, it would be quite evident that this technology could help us on the management of our patients. But when we started to, with the education of the HPI on other Spanish hospital, the adoption of this technology was absolutely amazing and fast. So it's quite easy to understand how useful could be the HPI and what could be the benefits of using the HPI. And that is the reason why the HPI is a technology that is very well accepted. And I think that from a physiological point of view and from a clinical point of view, avoiding arterial hypertension is something quite easy to understand. So the value of using the HPI, it's very easy. It's very easy to understand. And that is the reason for the increasing and fast acceptance of the HPI technology.